Our final lecturer today is Professor Barbara sherwood Lola from the University of Toronto. She is a university professor and earth scientist, a tier one Canadian research chair in isotopes of the earth and the environment, and director of the Stable Isotope Laboratory and the president of the Geochemical Society. Other recognition of her scientific leadership include selections as a Canadian Council, Canada Council Killen Fellow, Time Magazine Can Canada Leaders of the 21st Century, and the ENI Award for the Protection of the Environment presented to her by the President of Italy in 2012, just to name a few. Her research includes innovative use of compound-specific stable isotope techniques to track the source and fate of organic contaminants in groundwater, geochemical cycling of methane and hydrogen in ancient billion-year-old groundwater locked in kilometers deep in some of Earth's oldest rocks, and the role of deep subsurface, subsurface microbial communities in carbon cycling. It is a great honor today to have her as our closing speaker to give a short course lecture on biotic and abiotic methane sources and how to differentiate them. Thank you. That's to remind me that I stand between everyone and lunch. So <laughs> I'll try to uh, keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, with, of course, the renewed interest yet again in methane in the Mars atmosphere, I was asked to see if I could talk about differentiating between biotic and abiotic origins of methane, uh, drawing on lessons from Earth analogs. What have we learned on this planet about trying to crack this problem? And so I want to start first with just some of the definitions because some of the, uh, some of the early problems uh, that can still come about are because of there are some differences in terms of the definitions that sometimes get used. What I've tried to do here is pull together, by and large, the consensus definitions that more or less emerged amongst people studying methane on Earth over the last 20 years or so. So there's still some difference we'll see from time to time, but this is largely, I think, the consensus. And that is primarily to take a look over here on this side of the diagram and to consider both methane produced by microbes and methane produced by thermogenic processes, by the thermal alteration of high molecular weight organic material, and to consider both of those biotic in origin. The origin of this thinking basically comes down to thinking that both of the carbon sources in these cases is originally derived from life. So we consider both of those then biotic in that kind of a spectrum. And then on this side, of course, we have the abiotic processes, including both mantle-derived, or those related to magmatic or volcanic processes, but also this category, which really is developed, I think, largely with a lot of interest over the last 10 to 15 years, recognizing that abiotic processes might involve high temperature processes related to magmatic, but also both marine and continental systems show us as well that there are categories of reactions that I'll refer to as low to moderate temperature processes of water rock reaction. And that in both the marine and hydrothermal vents and in continental systems, there's a potential for these kinds of water rock reactions to undergo abiotic organic synthesis as well and produce methane. So that's been an evolution over time. At the same time, we've seen an evolution in our understanding of the isotopic signatures of methane. So again, I'm going way back here, sort of bringing a consensus picture from Martin Schulz's work back in 1988. But I think it's useful because it illustrates an ongoing point for us. And that is that the isotopic signatures have a high degree of overlap. Even if we take a look at both of the biotic methanes, thermogenic versus microbial, even if you include both carbon and hydrogen isotopes, this picture nicely illustrates the problem. There's a heck of a lot of overlap. And the isotopic signatures alone are not very useful way of trying to pull that apart, particularly if you have mixing from multiple sources of methane. For a while there, it was thought that when one went to abiotic methane, well, maybe the job would be easier. And you could use the isotopic signatures to differentiate between back, uh, microbial and thermogenic, generally biotic methane on this end, and the abiotic methane way over here in the enriched delta C13 signatures. With the thinking being that, of course, coming from a mantle carbon source, 
methane perhaps associated with the East Pacific rise or lost city hydrothermal vents would have very enriched signatures due to that mantle carbon source. But again, over the last 10 years in particular, as we begin to push this further and take a look at these other categories of water rock reaction, lower to moderate temperature processes of abiotic methane generation, both field studies and experiments have again rapidly shown us that we have got a large degree of overlap. I show here just values related to carbon isotope signatures. Uh, the amount of work that's been done on deuterium signatures for these kinds of abiotic uh, methane examples are still few and far between. But certainly, we're seeing already from the carbon isotope signatures that just as we saw for abiotic, we see the same for the uh, biotic large overlap in those signatures. And this is very sobering to those of us who call ourselves isotope geochemists. It is not a silver bullet. And I think it took the community a while to get used to that idea. And although as a card-carrying carbon isotope geochemist, I'm sorry to say it, carbon, even if you add it to hydrogen, values alone are simply not going to come anywhere close to defining the origin of the methane by themselves. And just to show one example of that, particularly around this idea of the abiotic methane, Abiotic methane can indeed have a delta C13 value that reflects the local carbon source. And if it is a mantle-derived source on this planet, then it will be enriched. But you can have a wide possible range of delta C13 values. And the key thing on this planet anyway to remember, and I think elsewhere as well, is that if it is mantle or magmatic derived, well, sure, it's going to be abiotic. But it can be abiotic without necessarily being mantle-derived. It seems like a very simple point, and yet it is one that we continue to trip up against a bit. So I think it's worth re-emphasizing at the beginning of a workshop like this. And so what we've seen then for methane on Earth is a recognition that these multiple sources cause us a, 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 a great uh, variety of particular sources that we could be looking at, and we have to think about ways that we can actually make measurements that are going to be more definitive in terms of resolving these different sources and contributions. <laughs> and certainly, I think over the last 20 years, if there's one thing we've learned, is that successfully attributing the origin of methane requires multiple lines of evidence, and in particular, contextual evidence. Last year, Giuseppe Otope and I, sitting over there, tried to pull some of this together in a review paper to try and emphasize these multiple lines of evidence. Some of them are listed here, again, just emphasizing isotopic signatures, of course, wonderful and essential, part of the problem solving. but particularly if you're measuring the carbon and hydrogen isotopic signature of methane alone, one needs to do much, much more, including measuring the carbon and hydrogen of source signatures, as well as any of the products of reactants, of the reactions that the methane might be involved in. We emphasized a lot in that paper the measurement of other associated species, whether those are gaseous or aqueous. For instance, measuring the uh, carbon source in the water dissolved in organic carbon, the hydrogen isotopic composition of the water itself in addition to the methane molecule, and the presence of other associated gases such as hydrogen, ethane, or the conservative tracers like noble gases can be extremely helpful. And in fact, I'll focus in particular on this one today in the second half of this talk. But keenly emphasizing, and it'll be the same obviously in the context of Mars, the importance of understanding the geological and hydrogeological context. In particular, if you're going to evaluate systems in which you might have a multiplicity of end members, and I think the same may be true for Mars, uh, multiplicity of end members, the potential for mixing, and in particular, this a sense of post-genetic alteration and sinks. So a large amount of work that needs to be involved. We all get excited about new technologies, and here too, I think we are looking at a particularly exciting period because I would be remiss today to not mention the really exciting work that's going on in clumped isotopologues of methane. I think this really does represent a breakthrough technology that can help us, but once again, I think it needs to be embedded in the context. So I won't change the main point that I'm trying to say. It takes a lot of work, even on this planet, to resolve the origin of methane. So a word on the clumped isotopes, because I, I, there's no point in me saying, talking a large about it when some of the experts on this are in the room here today. Of course, great work going on at UCLA, uh, Caltech here, and uh, the group at MIT as well, all of them developing slightly different techniques for trying to measure the clumped isotopes of methane. With the basic idea, well, at least originally being, 
that this would provide us with, for the first time, a reliable geothermometer for methanogenesis. That by measuring not simply the C13 methane or the methane with a single deuterium, by measuring the doubly substituted isotopolog with C13H3D, that from that we could actually get a temperature of formation of the methane. And early on, I think some of the thinking was that perhaps this would allow us, by looking at high temperature mantle derived methane, hydrothermal methane, thermogenic methane, and microbial methane, that this might yet again provide us with a way to get at abiotic versus biotic. This field has been developing in such an exciting way. There's so many good papers that have been coming out even just over the last six months that one of the key things that I want to emphasize is that with that kind of productivity, it's one of these double-edged swords, uh, we're seeing additional complications. But any time we have complications, I firmly believe that this is an opportunity. Because in fact, what we're seeing here is that there's a potential to get even deeper levels of information about methane above and beyond just the geothermometry. And so I'll just quickly mention three of them here and take a look at the papers to see what's coming out. But one of the key things is analogous to what I just mentioned before, as we all begin to become interested in these kinds of processes that tend to get clumped under the umbrella of serpentinization. That's really an umbrella term that's being used to invoke a whole variety of different water rock reactions. But the key thing that we point out here is that, once again, there's no silver bullet. This doesn't allow us to separate biotic and abiotic per se. Because of course we have not only the abiotic processes at high temperature going on, but also these low to moderate temperature abiotic organic synthesis from water rock reaction that tend to sit here somewhere between 100 and 200 degrees. So another set of processes that once again means that this is slightly more complicated, or less, potentially, or less. But the key thing being that this means that, once again, it's not a simple answer. These are going to be a fantastic tool. They will give us important information about geothermometry. But again, it's not a simple answer of dividing the world into biotic and abiotic methane. But they are difficult measurements to make. They are difficult measurements to make. Mixing, exactly. Well, that's, oh, oh thank you, because you're heading exactly where I'm going. <laughs> Mixing, we may need to do more than just the one isotopologue. And the other important thing to recognize in the work that's coming out of the MIT group is that, in fact, there may be many circumstances in which the equilibrium isotopic effects that are the basis of the geothermometer get overprinted by life. And in fact, we're seeing a number of cases where, because of microbial methanogenesis, particularly if it's taking place at a rapid rate, that this overprints the geothermometry information with kinetic <coughs> isotope effects. So again, that can be seen as a bad thing. We lose the geothermometry information, or it can be seen as a good thing, because it provides us with kinetic isotope information about the timing and rate of microbial methanogenesis. So everyone's excited about this stuff. But if there's one take-home point I want to make, and Chris has just made it for me, a lot of exciting work, difficult to do even on this planet. So how are we ever going to translate all of this, even if we get to the point where we think we could actually fly some of these and do this on another planet? What are we really going to do about Mars if it's this hard to do it on Earth? And so that's where I wanted to take this talk. For Mars, I think we need to consider a more parsimonious approach. I think we need to start by, first of all, asking ourselves, what are the minimum set of measurements that might head us in the right direction? Maybe not the minimum, maybe the initial set of measurements, but I think it's very worth looking at that long list of toolboxes and figuring out what's the smallest number we might need to measure that could actually tell us something about refining our hypotheses on the origin of methane on Mars, or at least identifying target sites. And so I'm going to suggest that that is, in fact, this measurement of the associated gases. And I'll show you in a moment why I feel that the measurement, in addition to methane, if it were possible at some point to measure hydrogen or ethane, that these ratios can be particularly helpful in the beginning diagnostic stages. Uh, conservative noble gases, of course, are extremely useful as well. Uh, can point you to a number of, pa of uh, papers that we've done where we've used the conservative noble gases as a way of dealing with this question of origins, sinks, and particularly constraining production rates and flux for the reactive reduced gases. But for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus just on those reactive gases.
The associated gases then, if we look at the abiotic M members, particularly those from the low temperature water rock reaction, whether that's in continental seeps, in the hydrothermal vents, or in the deep subsurface, if we look at these categories of reactions related, as I said, broadly speaking, to what people tend to call serpentinization, but this is really uh, an umbrella term we're using these days for a wide variety of water rock reactions that can produce hydrogen. Characteristically, if we look at methane that's abiotically produced by water rock reactions in those kinds of settings, what we see is that it's associated with very high concentrations of hydrogen, typically miller molar levels of hydrogen. Just for an example of that, this is from our own work in the saline fracture fluids on the Canadian Shield in the uh, superior province of the Canadian Shield in rocks that are 2.7 billion years old. We see that they're very rich in hydrogen and methane, again, attributed through a variety of different uh, experiments that we've done in the past to low to moderate temperatures of water rock reaction. And just to give you one sense of these kinds of end members on Earth then, I'm comparing here those samples from Kid Creek with samples from the Lost City hydrothermal vents. And what this just shows you are the concentrations of the reduced gases produced by water rock reaction from these two type sections. Lost City shown in the open rectangles and Kid Creek shown in the white rectangles. And again, just demonstrating that where we see methane that's been interpreted to be abiotically produced in these systems, we see substantial quantities of hydrogen as well. And in fact, very high quantities of the higher hydrocarbons, particularly in the uh, deep Precambrian shields. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But just again, indicating that where we see abiotic methane, we tend to see high concentrations of hydrogen. Similarly, if we go into these systems and by other means, working with microbiologists, identify that we have substantial microbial communities taking place and active microbial metabolism. As Ken showed us quite nicely, the first thing that these things do, particularly the sulfate reducers and methanogens that tend to dominate in these communities, is to suck those hydrogen concentrations down. So we end up with a bimodal distribution, abiotic methane associated with very high concentrations of hydrogen, and then often, in situations where the hydrogen concentrations have been driven way down, the presence of biotic methane. Moving on to the methane to ethane ratios, this has been known for quite some time, but again, I think it's important to think about, again, the abiotic end members associated with water rock reaction. These are often, as we've seen a moment ago from Kid Creek, often rich in ethane in addition to methane. And so these abiotic end members often result in relatively low methane to C2 ratios, usually less than 100, sometimes as low as 10. In contrast, microbial methanogens produce methane. They typically produce very little in the way of the higher hydrocarbons. So the other part of the end member, the microbial methanogens, the microbial methane, tends to have very high methane to C2 ratios on the order of several thousands. So these ratios alone provide us with a parsimonious approach to actually try and test these then using an appropriate earth analog. I could have done that using any of these various earth analogs, but what I've chosen today to do is to actually do a test case looking at ongoing reduced gas production from a part of the earth that I think hopefully will be quite relevant to the Mars question, which is ongoing reduced gas production of hydrogen and methane from billion-year-old rock, some of which, of course, has relevant mineralogy to Mars. Not all, but some. And so what I'm going to do then is take advantage of the fact that we produced last year a database on reduced gas concentrations in the Precambrian Shield on a global basis. It contains about 250 different gas seeps, uh, gas uh, boreholes, and fracture waters throughout the world from both our work and from work done by others. It's predominantly South Africa, the Canadian Shield, and Fennoscandia, but we were also able to draw together some uh, data from other parts of the Precambrian throughout the world. But before I do that, I want to try and explain a little bit more about that background. Um, we're all used to this idea when we compare our two planets, that the continental surface area of the Earth is approximately equal to the total surface area of Mars. But what I want to do is actually just do a quick age comparison between the continental landmass on the two planets. Very familiar with this picture, and Bethany walked us through that quite nicely earlier today. But what I want to do is just quickly ask the question, OK, if this is what we know about the, the age of the continental surface area of Mars, how much of the Earth consists of rock that was formed about the same time period? <coughs> 
And the reason I want to point this out is that there is often a common misconception that the Precambrian rock available to us on this planet is relatively minor, that we haven't got a lot to look at. And so I want to just sort of dispel that early on by going over quickly how much of the Earth's crust is in fact also, like Mars, billions of years old. I think some of the misconception comes about because indeed if you look at the Hadean, if you're looking for rock that's more than 3.8 billion years old, then you're going to have to look and look hard. I mean, there's only a couple of various uh, localities around the world, and typically we tend to say that the total amount of Hadean rock preserved on this planet is probably comparable to the size of the island of Montreal, which is a pretty small island. So indeed, for the Hadean, there isn't a lot of this kind of outcrop available. But if we move to the Precambrian, I think it's important to emphasize. Now, I always have a bimodal reaction in the room. Most geologists are aware of this, but many other people aren't. So I think it's worth emphasizing. 72% of the Earth's continental crust is Precambrian in age. So like Mars, most of the continents are billions of years old. That works out to about 14% of it Archean, 86% Proterozoic. But clearly, we do have a planet right here that has ancient billion-year-old crust that's worth investigating as a Mars analog, I think, much more extensively than we typically do. The Precambrian we still tend to think of as a repository of ancient information, that if we want to know something about the very old Earth, we'll go look at. And indeed, of course, it is. But what I'll be emphasizing today is that it's not just a repository of ancient information. There's life in the old girl yet. And just as Bethany pointed out, we've got to be interested in modern day processes that might still be going on on an old crust. Indeed, this is the kind of research essentially we're doing. We're looking at ongoing processes of water rock reaction related to microbial methanogenesis, related to life, but within the Precambrian systems. And specifically, looking at phenomenon like this, uh, these are fracture waters within the Precambrian continents globally, one, two, and three kilometers deep, saline waters that flow out of these rocks at high pressures and at high volumes. And as I showed you earlier, that are rich in reduced gases, hydrogen, methane, and higher hydrocarbons. Last year, as I mentioned, we pulled together this data set from our data and from work others throughout the world. Uh, the green and blue simply represents the Precambrian parts of the planet. Blue are the exposed Precambrian. That's more than 30% of the continental surface area. Green and blue together, uh, green are the covered Precambrian, and that's where you come to 72% of the continental surface area. These are from sites around the world and just demonstrating the very high amounts of hydrogen present in waters at some of these sites, ranging from uh, sites in ultramafic settings that tend to be up to 30 to 50% hydrogen to other sites, and I'll come back to these actually later in the talk just as I end, come back to other sites where in fact the hydrogen has been driven very, very low and obviously relevant to what I talked about earlier in terms of microbial methanogenesis and the origin of biotic methane, any sites where we have very low hydrogen are going to be quite intriguing. That particular paper also did some calculations to try to calculate on a global scale just how much hydrogen production is going on in the Precambrian. And essentially, um, by taking a look at both radiolysis and hydration reactions, we're able to account for as much hydrogen or equivalent amounts of hydrogen as the calculations that have been done for the marine lithosphere. And yet, this is the first time that we've really even looked at hydrogen production coming out of these rocks. So clearly, by looking only at the marine lithosphere rather than the old ancient continents, we've been missing a very substantial contribution of hydrogen. These were just put together for today's talk. Try to now take this to methane. This is for all the same data set, but in this case uh, shows you just what the values are like for methane. And as you can see then, at many of those sites where we see high hydrogen, we've got uh, methane values on the order of 10 to more than 80% of the free gas phase exolving from these waters. So these are high methane as well as hydrogen. And the other key point, high ethane as well. We can have ethane up to 5 to 15% of the free gas phase discharging from these rocks. So the reduced gases involving the major components of hydrogen, methane, and ethane. What's happening with all of these? Well, the water rock reactions, again, to move through it quite quickly, the hydrogen is product produced largely by radiolysis and, depending on the uh, mineralogy of the rock, by serpentinization, 
or I'd say more broadly, hydration of mafic and ultramafic rocks. And essentially, depending on the site, that hydrogen is driving a deep carbon cycle. There are many sinks for the hydrogen. I'm just focusing on this now in the context of methane. But what we certainly know is we see sites where that hydrogen is being incorporated into a abiotic carbon cycle. And as I mentioned, we have sites in which there is clearly abiotic organic synthesis going on and methane that's primarily abiotic in origin. At other sites where there's active microbial communities, a lot of that hydrogen is being soaked up into the microbial metabolisms through things like both sulfate reduction but also through microbial methanogenesis. In most of these subsurface communities, this is largely via a CO2 reduction pathway. So depending on the sites, we sometimes see this abiotic cycle dominating. At other sites, we see the um, biotic or microbial methane cycle dominating. And of course, we have mixtures in between the two. But this is why we felt this would be an appropriate place to use this parsimonious test case. Can we actually carry out this test case of seeing whether measurement of just these associated gases can help us to identify on a global scale in billion-year-old rock whether or not we might have a biotically dominated or an abiotically dominated methane. So we're going to take a look at the hydrogen levels, the ethane levels, translate those into the ratios. And just to keep it simple, because I do want to finish in the next five minutes that I've got here, I'm going to do this first rather than try to go through the entire globe. I'll just do the test case for you on the South African system, where over the past 20 years, we've worked at uh, several dozen mines throughout the Witzwaters-Rand Basin, and where we've probably gathered the greatest amount of contextual evidence about the origin of methane in these mines. So in other words, I'm going to pick this spot because it's the one where we know the answers. We've got a lot of information at which we've been able to determine where we have abiotic and where we have biotic methane. But let's go in and do it as a test case and see if by measuring just the methane, the hydrogen, and the ethane, we could have come in close to getting that same answer. So again, I'll just focus on down here first, just the witzwaters rand Basin. And this is the data, again, just for hydrogen. The interesting thing about the WITS is that we've always seen a bimodal pattern in the sites there. We have some sites that are quite high in hydrogen, as you see here, Kloof, Tautona, Impenang, Dreifontein. These all have hydrogen in the order of 1 to 10 percent by volume. So they're relatively high hydrogen sites. But in contrast, we've also got these other sites, Evander, Beatrix, Massimonge, Mares Pruitt, where the hydrogen is very low, in some cases below detection limit, again, suggestive of something that's actually consuming hydrogen within those sites. If we then move to the methane to ethane ratios, you recall I proposed earlier that something less than about 100 might be considered potentially to be an abiotic, whereas something in the 1 to 2,000 is more likely consistent with a biotic or microbial methane signature. Moving again to South Africa, we'll see that we get that answer back where we saw high levels of hydrogen suggestive of an abiotically dominated system. There we see a methane to ethane ratios less than 100. So quite consistent with an abiotic, primary abiotic origin for methane at these sites. In contrast, as we move to these others, Dreyfonte sorry, uh, Evander, Beatrix, Massimonge, and Maris Pruitt, you'll recall these were the sites where the hydrogen had disappeared. And similarly, we see a giant uptick in the methane to ethane ratio into the order of one to 1,000. So just by measuring those three gases, then, we've actually been able to confirm that the associated gases could have helped us just successfully identify sites with microbial methane. Now, I mentioned we do have 20 years worth of context. This is actually consistent where sites where multiple lines of evidence, including both culture and genomic data, support the dominance of microbial methanogenesis. So we went in with that in our pocket. We knew it was there. But I think I'm able to show you that if we had only this information, we still might have been able to at least identify the major differences between those sites and to identify them potentially as target points for further investigation of abiotic versus biotic end members. And so, you know, to really solve the problem, you need a lot. But in terms of Mars, of course, what we need to spend, and I want to look forward to spending the week doing with this crew, is to try to identify
which of these are actually the parsimonious approach? Which are the ones we can do now? Which are the ones that are going to be worth the most development work to see uh, the mo where we can get the most bang for our buck in terms of trying to get at a problem that necessarily requires a large amount of work to really do uh, uh, definitively. I've got about a minute and a half left, so I guess I will just add in this last bit. The one thing that's important to mention is that most of that data that I just showed you from the Precambrian shields of Earth is from the subsurface. So one of the key questions for both the Earth and Mars is to what extent is it really relevant that you've got processes of reduced gas production going on in the subsurface? To what degree is that ever going to make it to the surface? And I think these are also extremely important questions. We talked about some of this earlier today already when you talked about the ephemeral nature of some of these measurements in the Mars atmosphere. It's an identical problem on Earth, and it's one that at this point is actually being investigated by a wide number of different groups. But what we do know is in certain places, certainly, we see those reduced gases coming to the surface. There are diffuse seeps over the cratons, where we see the emission of those reduced gases. This is a picture from Giuseppe's work at the uh, Chimera sites in uh, uh, Turkey. In addition, in the far north of Canada, this is up on Axel Heiberg Island, even in an area that's got uh, 500 meters of permafrost, we still have perennial springs that are discharging methane to surface. So these are important sites to look at in this issue as well. And then finally, one of the other areas that we're working at are trying to take a look at fractured terrains or terrains with particular mineralogy and structures. In particular, working at kimberlite pipes throughout the north of Canada, taking a look over the kimberlite fields to see if there's any evidence of these reduced gases from subsurface water rock reaction actually exolving out of groundwaters above the kimberlite pipes. And uh, I won't try to make this work here because that usually triggers a, a failure, but this is actually a video we have of indeed some of the hydrogen and methane discharging from groundwaters above some of the kimberlite pipes in northern Ontario. Um, we're not the only ones who are doing this. There are diamond prospectors who have figured this out. And there are diamond prospectors who are actually searching for kimberlite pipes in the north by doing regional surveys of hydrogen in air above these terrains to try to identify pipes that have not been found yet in the context of diamond exploration. So obviously, the question remains the extent to which reactions producing reduced gases at surface, in the subsurface will discharge something that can be measurable within an oxic and well-mixed atmosphere. But I think it's clear that these kinds of questions that we're coming up with when we look at these kinds of terrains on Earth are very similar to some of the ones that uh, Curiosity has been dealing with as well over the issue of the Mars methane findings. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the various people who contributed much of the data that you saw here today. And I think I'm more or less on time and can get you to lunch.